All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Augustine, uh, part of the Lynx Lab, and uh, I'm going to be talking about efficient grounding for templated SRL systems. And uh, statistical, racial or statistical relational learning, or SRL, is kind of like your classical statistical machine learning plus uh, relational data minus the IID assumption. And breaking that assumption means we take a very heavy computational hit. And kind of the classical um, SRL frameworks will take like very simple rules like the ones you see there. And uh, you can take some data and you can see this very simple data we have here. And they generate these complex graphical models. As you can see there, that's the actual graphical model for that very small rules and data. So my work is about making this efficient in many, many different domains, whether it's about some sort of optimization domain, whether it's um, some sort of systems thing. In this particular one, I'm going to be framing it as a uh, um, query rewriting problem. And, you can, and we have to search over the um, query rewrites, either in maybe simple trees of like 40 nodes at the top, or very complex ones of 40,000 one that you can barely see on the bottom. So come to my poster if you want to see, find out how I do that. All right. Hi, folks. I'm Brian Blanchett. I'm in the philosophy department. And uh, what I'm working on is uh, here. Um, so from social media to search engines, people form beliefs increasingly from filtered information. And uh, however, the inner workings of the, those information sources are often unclear, uh, which obscures subjects' ability to judge the epistemic value of this information. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying, hey, there are very specific techniques, like CNNs or whatever it might be, that um, we don't necessarily have a great idea of how we arrive to that situation. And there are um, certain situations where we need to accept these kinds of black box tech because, um, well, frankly, we make all kinds of decisions um, in a sort of humane black box all of the time. Um, and so my work goes through um, four different situations in four different areas, so like targeted advertising, um, self-driving cars, and a few other areas, and shows you very specifically in what kind of situations and what kind of societal groups we need to have except the black box and except not. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Faiza, and I'm in uh, Natural Language Understanding Lab. Uh, I've work, uh, I'm working on interactive story generation. So what if a computer can tell us a story? and why do we really care about the stories? Since the, and the answer is because this is how humans have been co communicated since the beginning of the time, and the stories are actually the central to human cognition and communication. Uh, so uh, in this regard, automatic story generation is actually the task of uh, composing a coherent and fluent uh, passage of text about a sequence of events. And in particular, I'm working on interactive yet automatic storytelling, uh, which uh, actually in which the user co uh, collaborate with a computer to generate more coherent and personalized story. And we are motivated in particular with this application on uh, in entertainment uh, for storytelling with kids, uh, education, especially with uh, people who have disabilities, and in particular as an assistive tools for human writers. And this is how the system looks like, uh, where the user can guide the content of the stories by generating cue phrases. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Melissa Klein from the Genomics Institute, and I'm here because we have a need for privacy-preserving computation, and we are here in search of guidance. Here is the problem we're working on, that nowadays genetic testing can you know, reveal a lot of heritable predisposition to disease, but our ability to interpret genetic variants has been outpaced by our ability to discover new ones. The interpretation, most of the time, requires personalized information, well, requires patient-level information. So we're working toward, you know, toward um, federated analysis and, and differential pr you know, privacy to, you know, to compute, to estimate you know, the, the risk of, of disease from you know, variation, and we're in the early stages, and we're trying to figure out this problem space. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi everyone, my name is Mahika. I'm with the Creative Coding Lab. We have a couple projects on display today at the intersection of machine learning, data visualization, and art. Um, the particular project that I'm gonna be presenting is an interactive brush-based canvas style transfer application in which we give users the ability to interact with multiple different style models of, made off of various paintings and data viz pieces and um, kind of develop an intuition for how this algorithm works and what sort of features are captured by these algorithms. So come check out our poster. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Varun, a grad student here. And as grad students, we all can agree that we're always short of cash. And so the first thing when you want to do, when you buy something I do is go online, check out Amazon, eBay, and a bunch of other places to see which one has the cheapest offer or if there are better alternatives. And if you want to build a tool like that, the first thing you want to do is to first see what categories across these different uh, e-commerce sites are the same. So that is my uh, paper, aligning product categories across uh, using Anchor products. And there are a couple of challenges doing this. One is that these there are thousands of categories and it's not possible to evaluate all of all the pairs. The one is just the names are not sufficient. For example, let's say you have accessories, one under the men category and the other under the women category. Are they the same? Are they not? So just the names is not sufficient. And finally, you have different granularity of categories. One is makeup. The other might be makeup tools and brushes. It's a lot more granular. So you need to distinguish these kinds of uh, granular categories. So what we propose in our paper is a joint probabilistic framework, which creates a probability distribution over all possible alignments and finds the best one. So for more details, uh, come visit our posters. Hello, everyone. My name is Xi. I work with Dr. Uh, Alvaro Cardenas from Computer Engineering. So our work is anomaly detection in SCADA system. SCADA is a system where uh, collect and uh, manage data in uh, industrial control systems like smart grid in this work. Uh, so we analyze network traffic data. Uh, we'll use uh, a model based on the, this uh, grid time Markovian chain to uh, set up the baseline of the normal behavior. So as you see in figure two, uh, and with this setup, then we can identify some abnormal states and hopefully we can export more details from this uh, normal states can provide more information than just uh, identifying those anomalies. So just imagine how important for a smart grid, like your electricity just uh, suddenly go out for uh, days. And so those are very critical problem in the security area. Uh, that's my work. Welcome to, uh, to stop by most my poster. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Akul. Um, I'm part of Professor Liu's lab, and we're working on looking at low-labeled uh, data sets. So um, labeling data is very expensive, um, and oftentimes not all your points will have be labeled. So we're taking the assumption that given 20% of your data is labeled, how can you create accurate labels for the unlabeled points in your data set, and how can you reduce the noise so that the classifier that you create based on these unlabeled data, or the labels on these unlabeled data um, is accurate. Um, so if you're interested in you know, any of those topics, um, please come by and visit and we can talk more. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, today's graphs run into millions of nodes and billions of edges. So how do we make sense of such big graphs? One way we do that is by looking at counts of certain patterns, like cliques. So, my problem is, given a graph, how do I count the number of k-cliques in the graph? The number of k, a k-cliques is just a set of k vertices all connected to each other. Uh, existing methods uh, use parallelism, and despite that, they're only able to count up to k equals 13. We provide a non-parallel exact counting clique method that counts all k-cliques in a fraction of the time that other algorithms take. So for example, for a graph that had 6 million edges and uh, 0.6 million vertices, our algorithm took 30 seconds to count all cliques, where the state-of-the-art parallel algorithm actually, even in five days, could not count the number of 13 cliques. And our algorithm is actually based on a very simple observation about a classic algorithm that has been around for decades. And we realized that it actually does much more than was previously thought. 
And this actually improved the theoretical runtime complexity as well. And for more, please visit the poster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a PhD student in statistics here working with Bruno Sanso. Um, I'm not going to try to summarize the whole poster in this sale session, but uh, come to my poster if you want to talk about Bayesian statistical methods and for spatial data, uh, non-stationary spatial modeling, uh, variable selection in infinite dimensional spaces and things like that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Avital. I'm an, I'm an artist from the Digital Art and New Media program, and I'm showing uh, my art installation, which is called Classification Cube, um, that invites people to come and intimately engage with um, machine learning classifiers that uh, recognize their face, their gender, age, emotion, and action. And it's interesting because people uh, start performing in it and asking questions like, how come it's always wrong about my body? Or what gesture can I make to transform my gender? So uh, inside the queue, people can also compare their physical body to virtual bodies that are being classified as well. Come see it also in the dark building. It's up there at the MFA exhibition and the poster outside. Uh, hi, my name is Nojan. I work with Professor Seshadri. So our problem is actually very simple. If we count the uh, vertex orbits of a graph with million uh, edges, so what is a vertex orbit? Vertex orbit is the role of a node or a vertex uh, in a graph. So in these patterns, the nodes with the same color have the same, or, uh, same uh, orbit. Uh, for example, a star graph, there is one node in the center, and there is all the leaves in the periphery. So orbit count is the number of times a node in a large graph is incident to a subgraph pattern, and how many of those times it's in th that orbit or in, has that role in the subgraph. So we do this counting uh, in minutes for graphs with millions of edges, and it's a thousand times, at least a thousand times faster than the state of the art. And for more details, please uh, visit the poster. Thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Connor, and the other person working on this was Vibin, and we were doing o NC resolution on online games using social structure and social behavior. Uh, NC resolution is the task of resolving noisy references into their underlying entity. In this case, the noisy references would be the profiles from the different chess websites you hear, and the um, entities would be me and Vibin. Um, and obviously, this is a very important task because other things down the line, like uh, uh, knowledge base construction, or um, knowledge graph construction and um, recommendation systems um, need good NC resolution in order to give a good result. And so in a case like this, where we're allowed to choose our own username and have different uh, profiles that are different over time, it becomes very difficult. And so we're using the game structure, or the game uh, behavior of a player and also the stro social structure, like their friendships, to try and resolve this a little bit better. So if you're interested in seeing how we did it, come on by. Hi, my name is Angela Ramirez, and I worked with Steve Whitaker to try to understand which factors um, influence the emotional state after using a wellness application or intervention system. I looked at three different applications, Emoticale, Echo, and Mood Adapter, and how I was able to look at emotional state was um, three different well-being um, three different well-being questionnaire systems. And so then I was able to look at the correlations between these features and the change of uh, emotional state. And then I was able to look at which features actually predicted on um, the change of emotional state. So whether or not users ended in a l higher emotional state or a lower emotional state. So then be able to see, are there different, um, are there any patterns that we're able to recognize? And yeah, come by to ask for more. Hi, I'm Lena Reed. I'm in the Natural Language and Dialogue Systems Lab. I work in neural natural language generation, and in this work, we were interested in how end-to-end -end neural generators collapse sentence planning and surface realization into one step, and therefore, they're hard to control. So we did three experiments, one on sentence scoping to decide how to allocate content across sentences, one on distributive aggregation for distributing new adjectives across noun phrases, 
and one on discourse, discourse contrast um, for generating examples of contrast, even though it is seen infrequently in training. So if you're interested in this, please come to my poster. Hey everyone, I'm Vihang from the Lynx Lab, and I'm going to tell you about my poster, which is comparison of weight learning techniques. Is this the? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. This was not okay. Never mind. Anyway, so data comes in many different forms, and much of the real-world data has some sort of relational structure to it. This structure can be represented through graphical models, and PSL is one such model. In PSL, we use rules as, you, as the rules that you can see there to reflect these relations, but not all relations are equal. So we give weights to each rule to reflect their relative importance. The interesting question here is how to decide what weight to give to each rule, and that's what we've been working on, a comparison of all weight learning techniques. So please come by to poster number 20 to know more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abhishek, and as part of the Global Edge Data Management Group, we are trying to create a, 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 an infrastructure where we can have decentralized data on the user nodes so that uh, we can ensure a bit of privacy. And we, are, we also want to like allow queries to be executed or uh, uh, and, and results to be generated based on the data that is kept on the edge of the uh, basically at the user devices and uh, as part of this poster we, uh, we have three projects that are ongoing in the lab and uh, please feel free to come and chat with me about this hi i'm dan spencer i'm in the ams department here and what we want is reasonable inference from functional magnetic resonance images and how do we want it well, we want to take into account uncertainty, sparse signal, spatial structure, covariance estimation, and computational load, which is a lot to take in. But what we really want to do is be able to perform inference on the brain using some non-invasive technique like fMRI and learn about how the brain does things like process risk. If you want to learn more, come talk to me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sriram. The topic of this uh, project is lifted hinge loss mark of random fields. So the goal of the project is to perform, uh, to speed up inference time in large graphical models. Uh, why do we care about this? Data nowadays comes in more than just a table. It comes in like social network, where you have friends and colleagues, and you can use this to infer something like political affiliation. And when you apply these uh, simple structure to uh, uh, data, you end up with a large graphical model. And performing inference on large graphical models is always a tedious task. However, there exists something called symmetries in which you can group uh, identical uh, uh, variables and perform faster inference. So we exploit that and uh, a way to detect that in a special type of uh, graphical model called Markov random field, in hinge loss Markov random fields. And to know more about how we do it, come check out our poster, poster number 22. Wait, wait. Hi everyone, my name is Jason, and the poster I'm gonna to present today is MOBA item recommendation. So to give a little more context on what a MOBA is, a MOBA is essentially an online real-time strategy game where a user controls a single character on a team to compete against another team. And the goal of this game is essentially, it's like capture the flag where you try to capture your enemy's base. And throughout the game, uh, users will play this character and gain some in-game currency and they want to build like sets of item to give the, uh, the hero a power up. And so my problem is what items you want to build and you can only choose up to six items from a list of like hundreds of items. So if you're interested, just come to my poster and we can talk. Um, hey everyone, I'm Nikhil, and uh, I'm presenting uh, Pet Finder. So this is more aligned to the social aspect of today's theme. And uh, there's this application called uh, Pet Finder, which essentially helps you to find pets which need a home, right? 
in a particular location. But there are a lot of problems with this because um, sometimes the same pet could be presented in different ways. You're much more likely to adopt Hershey with this picture than that, right? So there are a lot of attributes which can be optimized. And what we want to do is try to identify which features can be optimized. Like the age can't be, but other factors can. So if you want to know more about this, please check us out. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is, uh, we're Chris, Michael. Um, we're working with, uh, our advisors are uh, Professor Norisi and Professor Hemboldt, and we're working with signal processing of EEG data for deep neural networks. Uh, electroencephalograms, or EEG for short, uh, are clinical uh, tests where they outfit a patient with uh, electrodes around the scalp to either test, study, and diagnose um, uh, brain damage or uh, mental disorders, brain tumors, seizures, stuff like that. Um, so our goal here is um, electroencephalograms uh, produce vast amounts of information, and we want to be able to come up. We want to come up with a uh, optimal data format or a pre-processing uh, mechanism where we take all this information and condense it into such a way that we can feed it to a deep neural network or uh, any algorithm that will exceed in or add pattern recognition. Um, so that's our goal, and here's a. Okay, yeah, so we got our data from the UCI ML um, repo, and um, what we did was we transformed the readings, the, the time series data, into time versus frequency slices, as well as uh, frequency slices. Um, oh, okay, well then we just feed that into machine learning models, specifically deep neural nets, that's our main focus. Hi, my name is Dimitri. I'll be talking about earthquakes. Um, earthquakes and subduction zones are potentially tsunamigenic, and the extent to which a tsunami is generated is controlled in large part by the depth of rupture. So we have uh, seismograms from a shallow earthquake and a deep earthquake. What we see in the shallow earthquake is ringing from water multiples generated. Um, and what we've done is trained a convolutional neural network to discriminate between shallow earthquakes and deep earthquakes. Long story short, it's working. Um, Seismic waves travel 20 times faster than the tsunami waves, so we can get predictions of whether or not a tsunami is enhanced by shallow slip within about 20 minutes. To put that in perspective, the Tohoku earthquake, the differential time between the earthquake and the tsunami arrival was about an hour. So we get about 40 minutes of warning. In poorly instrumented areas like Indonesia, this could be uh, critical to saving many lives. And the last thing I want to say is that we're, we have expertise in seismology, but we are n not as great with the machine learning. So in the spirit of responsibility, we want to try and do this correctly. So that's where you guys come in. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie. I come from the NLP lab. Today, my topic is Crucifix, a feature-rich approach to understand happiness. We started the data from the HappyDB, which is collected by Asia 2018. And they asked the Metallica to write down the happiness moment in one sentence and give labels to part of the data. The labels are agency, social, and concept. We explore to answer the following questions. How to model the happiness? Um, shall we try traditional machine learning method, deep learning? Or uh, shall we try feature engineering? And whether our models are robust enough for semi-supervised learning? Last but not least, how to interpret happiness? why people are happy. So if you're interested to know our answer, please come to our poster. And suggestion are also welcome too. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Ron. I'm from uh, Creative Coding Lab. And uh, we are building this app called um, Temple Cave. Uh, so Temple Cave is immersive interactive 3D visualization tool for neuroscientists to explore time theory connectome data sets. Connectome data sets is uh, gathered from uh, M fMRI scan of the brain. Uh, so our application support uh, researchers to upload their custom data and explore different representations of uh, connectome as well as explore connections in uh, connectome uh, at different time steps. It also support overlay comparison for different connectomes 
of uh, different time series uh, data, as well as you can compare the same connectome at a different time step and uh, or uh, different representations of the same connectome. Uh, and we, our applications support desktop as well as VR devices. Uh, if you want to know more about how we do it, please come to our uh, poster. Thank you.